Uh, my my uh, presentation today is on Swift and uh, Swift programming language and its type system. Uh, and today I'll start with a um, language overview. We'll go quickly through the type system and uh, why there was the need for it. And then um, more time will be devoted to its new programming model and the actual um, live demo. So. Um, uh, my name is Richard. I work as the Apple app developer uh, since 2014. So I've started using Swift since 2014. Before I learned Objective C in 2013, so I went uh, through the evolution of Swift uh, since version one to version five uh, right now. Uh, and um, I'm author of multiple libraries written fully in Swift. So I have quite a lot of experience with this language. And uh, that was a great, uh, great pleasure to work with. Um, Swift programming language is a general purpose, which means that it could, uh, it could work on any hardware and um, it could work for uh, pretty much any task from research to uh, reliable applications developer development. And it's multi-paradigm, which means that um, it's possible to combine multiple styles of programming, such as functional, imperative, object-oriented, or some other. It was pitched as Objective-C without C and released in 2014, open source 2015. So now um, it's possible to see the whole code of Swift compiler and um, uh, all of their standard libraries, um, foundation libraries and uh, asynchronous programming libraries. Uh, they are well open source. You can just look up their code. And um, it became really popular recently. Uh, now it's allowed to place in Taiobi programming language index. And now it's re relatively could be considered that it surpassed Objective-C, the, the one language that it's based on in popularity in 2018 to 2020, depending on how you count it. So uh, uh, what is that stands for Objective-C uh, without the C? Uh, and uh, uh, to, to uh, Understand that we need to go uh, go back and see what what um, what Objective C was for. So first of all, Swift is a general purpose language uh, and multi platform language. Uh, it is supported on uh, all of the Apple platforms right now, which is more more uh, than 1.4 billion active devices, and uh, it's officially supported on Ubuntu, uh, Linux, but um, there are already versions of Swift running on Android, Windows, and uh, it's officially supported by the TensorFlow. Um, so if we go back to Objective-C, uh, the Objective-C was mainly an Apple ecosystem programming language. And if we uh, think how old is it, it's, it's basically a 30 years old language. So uh, uh, the major milestone is 1984 when Objective-C was created as the purely object-oriented language. And uh, the uh, next computer, the company that was created by Steve Jobs, um, they adopted object-oriented language like Objective-C to create, uh, to give advantage for developers to create uh, the window-based graphic interfaces, which were uh, a cutting edge technology back then. And uh, uh, the Apple acquired Next and the basis of next step of that operating system, object-oriented operating system, was put into the Mac OS X uh, in 1998. Uh, uh, and basically since then, uh, the language and the whole runtime, they, uh, I would say, kept unchanged. And now we have the same runtime, like uh, it's based on the same next step um, from 1989. It's running on iPhone, on Apple Watch, uh, and on Mac. Basically all of that uh, is from there. And Objective-C, is the language which has uh, uh, which is which has those traits of, of that time, and um, only in 2014 the Swift was released, um, and a uh, major milestone in 2019 is ABI stability, which means that now um, a Swift version could be included inside an operating system, so there is no need to package a Swift uh, with uh, each individual application because now, uh, 
new, newer versions of Swift will be compatible with the previous one. So it dramatically reduced the, the, um, the package size. So objective C is, uh, as I said, a strict superset of C and it's very object oriented language in, in a classical sense. Uh, it uses messages to pass around. Pretty much everything is an object, but uh, any C program is an objective C program as well. Uh, so um, it's possible to use the C in its uh, direct form in any objective C programs. And uh, the type system of objective C uh, is quite weak but uh, it's applied in a clever way, which gives it, um, which gives the compiler quite a lot of edge when uh, when suggesting uh, suggesting for improvements and suggesting the types. So uh, basically, the compiler checks that the method is defined on the particular type, but um, uh, the user, the the developer, um, have to specify the type uh, himself. And uh, if there is a type mismatch, of course, it will show just a warning, not an error. Um, and uh, uh, if the user if the developer tries to uh, um, code something with a bit mismatching type, sometimes it might be uh, the program might compile and it's very runtime oriented language. And I guess that was the main problem. So uh, another problem was for that uh, there were, uh, there were a lot of uh, issues with the way language was designed uh, that caused a lot of uh, common programming mistakes simply because we're all humans and we all make them. Um, like we forget something uh, and because of that, uh, of that uh, mission, um, an error could spread around the application. And what made the situation even worse is the, the whole design of the language. Like sending message to a nail didn't cause a crash. It just, uh, the program just continued execution, nothing happened. And um, then there were so-called optional interfaces. So uh, in Java, there is a notion of a protocol. In, uh, in Haskell, I guess it's called a type class if uh, I'm not, if I'm not um, uh, wrong. Basically, which shows what these types support, what kind of methods can be accessed on this type. And uh, in Objective C, if the object is declared as supporting this type, there is no guarantee that uh, supporting this this interface, mm, supporting this uh, method or variable, um, it should have that variable that I can access. Uh, it's not guarantee that it actually supports the interface. So you have to check whether the interface is supported. And the syntax was quite complex for uh, most people to learn um, if they are coming from a Java background or C background. It's a very unique syntax. And another problem which I would address is that it's not functional at all. Functions are not first class citizens. You cannot assign a function um, to a variable uh, and pass it around and then do some computation um, in, in some different part of your software or of your program. Uh, there, is, there is though some possibility for, for functional uh, programming, but they are, they are rather limited. So let's look how Objective-C code looks like. And that's very, very, common, um, very common pattern that is used all over the place. Uh, so the first line is just, we check that the delegate is not nil. And if the delegate is responding to a specific selector, that's what I meant when I was talking about the optional interface. So uh, if we don't check for that, mm, we might cause a crash. And then only if everything is okay, if the delegate is response to that particular method, and if the delegate is there, we can call it and um, uh, pass our new information that something has been selected. In Swift, the same functionality could be reduced to just one line. So uh, all of that because of its type system. Uh, notice the question marks. Um, those are optional, in optionals. They indicate that the method should be called only if that exists. So if the delegate uh, exists, then the method be called. If the table view did select from at method uh, mm, 
is implemented by that delegate, then only it will be called. Otherwise, it, it will just do nothing. Same, uh, the same uh, functionality, but encoded in a very concise form. That's the gist of Swift. Another example of Objective C is uh, would be this. So, uh, very simple example. We put two strings in an array, and we try to access one, uh, one and the second of them. So, uh, but it's interesting that um, there is um, uh, when we try when when we incorrectly try to uh, when try to incorrectly uh, assign a type. So we assign it as an ns number. It compiles just fine. It runs just fine. So there is no crash at this time. Uh, the uh, the code is just continuing executing. And even when we try to iterate over the array and print its contents, there is no problem because uh, both string and number, they uh, respond to the same methods for printing an object. So there is no crash. Everything is fine. And the crash happens only when we try to access a specific number-like method, which is supported only by numbers. And that is obviously a string inside, which is the know it. Uh, and that causes a crash. And recognize selector center instance. So that's the gist of type system of Objective C. On the contrary, Swift type system is a very rigid, uh, statically typed language. And as much information is tried to be uh, inferred at the compile time in order to assess runtime. So uh, Swift type system is very simple. Um, it has basically two kinds of types. It has name types and compound types. And I would like to uh, quickly go through both of them. Name types have a name. They define in the standard library and examples of those would be classes, structs, and protocols. Compound types, they don't have a name and they part of the Swift language itself. So uh, there are basically two compound types, only functions and tuples. Uh, and as the name suggests, compound types can have, uh, can be combined by uh, having multiple other compound types or name types. So uh, first of all, the compound types. Uh, the basic one of those is tuple. We can uh, have a tuple um, with arguments or without, oh, sorry, with argument names or without, like the top, uh, top one uh, is basically we create a, user and we create a user with the names, with uh, argument names, and then we just uh, uh, assign one to another. Since it's a uh, compound type, not named one, those, um, it's important that the types match, but those argument names are kind of relevant in this context. And the, the other one is the function. So uh, we return this tuple, we can return uh, a tuple from a function and uh, we just create a tuple on the fly. And, um, um, and yeah, so we can use that for a multiple return. And function is uh, also um, another option of compound, compound type. Uh, simplest functions are on the top. Uh, so uh, basic no arguments function and we, uh, the return type is indicated by the arrow. We can emit uh, void if it's, uh, if it's returning nothing. And uh, we can have uh, different kinds of, uh, the, the argument signature should be, should indicate uh, what function takes in and what it does it return. We can have multiple return and uh, multiple arguments. It supports variadic arguments. So it's a quite a free language in, in that sense. And uh, um, so of course we can pass functions um, uh, into the functions. So it's a truly functional language. Uh, if you take a look at the second uh, function, it, it takes another one as its argument, although the type signatures have to match. And again, we don't, uh, the actual names of the arguments don't really matter there since we can, since the top function has the value and the bottom function that there is not even at type names, they are just uh, types. Um, like integer to void, and that's enough. So we can pass this function and, for example, print it. Named types are a bit more complex. Uh, there are four 
name types and strict class, struct, enum, and protocol. So you might have a question, how about ints, doubles, strings, and uh, uh, some other structures? Well, all of those are structs and they are defined in the standard library. So uh, I think that makes a Swift type system is very simple that uh, pretty much everything uh, in the standard library is a struct or a protocol. And let's go through classes first. Um, so the class uh, declaration is pretty simple. We can have um, a few constants or variables declared and that also supports lazy initializations. So like a string will be uh, initiated only when some, some object or some function will try to access it. Let's compile that. And we get a uh, compilation error because we haven't initialized all of our variables. So that's the first pillar of Swift safety. And by uh, the compiler ensures that all of the types we declare as int and string are actually there as done null. So um, they will be present at the runtime. So we just uh, give uh, the default values. And now uh, our program compiles. And uh, please note that there is no root class at all. We can have one if we want, but um, you don't have to specify uh, a root class um, for your uh, subclasses, unlike in many other programming languages such as Java or Objective-C, which are more object-oriented. Structs are um, very similar to classes. But uh, one fundamental difference is that they are so-called value types. They have no identity. So uh, structs could be defined um, mm, simply by uh, a struct construct, and we can uh, add a few properties there. We can have some uh, functions as well. Uh, the initializer will be created by the compiler for you. Um, if uh, it's a, some simple case, like um, just a few, uh, few properties. Um, for those simple cases, the, the compiler auto-generates the initializer. So this part will be created for you. You don't have to specify. And the uh, summary, class, they're very similar. Uh, classes, they, but the, the core difference of them is the semantics, how you, uh, how you could use them in code. Class has an identity, so uh, we can have a, one instance of a class and another instance, and they will be different simply because they are different instances. The data could be the same, and they always pass a reference, so uh, they are not copied. Uh, whenever you pass a class into argument, it's always referenced to a specific object. And of course, they support um, inheritance and uh, all of the uh, object-oriented um, features. Struct, on the other hand has no identity. So uh, when you copy a struct, as, the, as an example below, the, uh, the data will be simply copied to a new struct. And since there, their paths will be separate. If you mutate one object, uh, there will be no effect on the other one. So, um, uh, and so that's why they don't have identity. And uh, it's good to think of a struct as, uh, some sort of value uh, as the number or string or just a piece of information, but not a specific, uh, not a specific object you can act on. Enums, very briefly, um, just an enumeration type. Uh, for example, left, right, um, middle, center. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, left, middle, uh, cent uh, right. Maybe some other examples like uh, uh, up, down. Uh, and um, they are, of course, a bit improved uh, with the compiler support. So um, first of all, enums can have so-called role types. So they can have uh, a backing of a string. So this, the, uh, under the hood, this direction enum now is a string and all of that is compiler generated. So um, when we print 
uh, try to print what is the direction of the uh, of this variable, what is the direction, we'll get left as a string because that, that's basically a string and the hood. And of course, if we want, we can customize that to our uh, taste. But the, uh, mm, but the most power of Swift lies in its protocol system. And um, I think that's the most interesting um, topic of those. So all of those uh, really uh, could be mixed with the protocols. And the protocols is simply a set of requirements imposed upon a type. If you think about the class or stack, they have a, a defined interface which you can access, but the protocol, um, uh, and, and they have this, this name, it's name type. But the protocol, it also has name, but it does not specify um, that you have to use specific class or specific struct. Uh, you can use any uh, of those, or you can use even enum, it doesn't matter. Um, and let, uh, the only requirement is that all of these uh, specific uh, rules will be implemented and satisfied. And uh, uh, those uh, rules could be a variable, initialize, initializer, or method requirement. So some sort of interface. Uh, they can inherit in other protocols. So uh, if, and uh, what's interesting, and I think that's uh, very, um, much a feature of Swift is they can have a default implementation. Um, default implementation is something that you are uh, giving to an object when it just adopts this protocol and uh, some interface is readily available, implemented. So they are in a way similar to type classes of Haskell, as I said. So um, that there, there is some interface and if the object satisfies or, uh, or, or uh, object satisfies that interface, it can be passed into that uh, argument as an argument. So um, here's the diagram. Basically we have class struct and enum. They all can conform to one or more protocols and the protocols themselves can inherit in other protocols and contain those requirements. And of course we can compose it. We can just declare that uh, this protocol is uh, these and these protocols together. So if they two, uh, if those two requirements are satisfied, we can call this to be um, this new like compound protocol. And let's look, let's take a look at what does that mean in a, in a, in a broader sense. So I would like to think of a protocol oriented programming as the different uh, different representations of the same uh, system of the same um, object. Um, that could be photo, map, or list of tallest buildings. And um, they all refer to the same thing in the end. They all refer to New York in this case, but uh, they all uh, show and bring up front some specific traits of those uh, objects, of the system. And if we uh, know some relationship, we can establish some relationship between them. For example, we can use a map to create a route uh, and uh, use a list of tallest buildings to plant, uh, to, to create this route of, uh, mm, around the tallest buildings. And then we can take a picture uh, from all of those uh, buildings. Um, and the result will be pretty much the same if you could uh, mm, have a map of New York or a map of uh, Moscow or Helsinki. The only requirement is that the, your map uh, refers to the same city as your list of tallest buildings. And let's say you can't use the map of New York to find a list of tall, to, to, to take a picture of uh, tallest buildings uh, uh, with the Moscow's list, that would just not match. And that what Swift compiler will enforce uh, to you um, at the compile time if you declare your types right. So, and that's extensively used in the um, Swift standard library. So uh, if you think about how the uh, number defined in Objective-C, it basically inherits from object, uh, the root class and its object, uh, then it inherits to NS value and NS number is basically a leaf class. And it obviously adopts a few protocols, uh, but even those protocols are 
uh, Swift based protocols, which are back ordered for compatibility. And Swift is a completely different uh, universe. We have an end type of integer, and uh, it has no root class, it's just there. Uh, and uh, it has a lot of protocols. So those are, uh, I guess, not even a half of all protocols Swift, um, Swift's type and supports. And uh, uh, all of the relationship between those types are um, defined in the protocols, at the protocol level, not at the struct, uh, primitive structures level. And uh, let's look a bit more in detail on this topic on a few examples. So equatable is one of these protocols. So it basically allows us to uh, check if these objects or structs or, um, or values are equal. And you can define uh, these rules in your uh, type. So uh, one interesting point is that uh, the compiler already enforces that uh, in order to be equatable, in, in order to um, uh, ask if these projects are, if these objects are equal, they have to be of the same type. That is enforced by the self requirement at the very bottom. So they they have to have exactly the same type. Otherwise, obviously, they are not equal. And there is an extension. So if the type supports an equatable protocol, we can define when those types are not equal. They are not equal when simply um, this equality uh, rule is not, uh, is not enforced. If we can't say that they are equal, then they are unequal. And that is given for free simply when the type um, adopts this equatable protocol. Uh, and now protocol composition. So there are a few protocols uh, for encoding and decoding uh, values. So let's say from and to adjacent to an uh, object. And uh, there is a protocol called codable. And the codable is simply a composition of those two, which means if uh, the type supports encodable and decodable, well, we can call it codable. I would like to do a quick demo, um, just a simple uh, overview of um, what we can do with our protocols and compositions. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, a Swift playground. I hope everybody can see the text clearly. Is it okay? So we now uh, could start um, programming. So let's define uh, a few protocols. We have a protocol called electric. And the only requirement would be to charge. And we have a protocol called uh, petrol. And, and the uh, function would be to refuel. And uh, let's define a few uh, few classes which will conform to that protocol. Um, for example, uh, we'll have a car, or let's name it a Tesla. It's an electric car. And uh, now we'll create something, um, let's say, oh, type Tesla does not conform to protocol, so I can't compile this, all right. Do you want to add promo stubs? Yes, okay. So now we can, uh, the compiler already helps us to um, enforce the protocol requirement. So I can't even compile my, uh, my mm, program without all of the protocols being satisfied. So we have some uh, uh, code for charging and now we create uh, another card, let's say uh, bands. And that would be petrol car. And uh, uh, and uh, okay, expected body. So I need to add something here. Uh, 
And uh, and now uh, here comes the Volvo owner and says, well, I want to refuel my Volvo, but I can't refuel it with a diesel. Uh, oh, sorry, I can't refuel it with petrol. It's a diesel car. And our system kind of breaks down. So, uh, well, let's try to improve it. Let's create another protocol. And uh, we need to refuel it, of course. Uh, but uh, they need a different fuel. So how could we enforce that so that we can't put uh, diesel and petrol cars in one, uh, in one system? Well, um, we'll create another protocol, which is called uh, um, a li liquid fuel. And uh, we'll move the refuel method there. And all of these protocols will just, um, will, will just inherit the liquid fuel protocol because well, petrol and diesel are liquid fuels, right? So we can just inherit that. And um, and uh, everything would work just as well. We can have the same uh, uh, refuel function. And what I just did uh, is uh, called uh, retroactive modeling. So we uh, we had our uh, data model before. And now some new requirement came into that contradicts the whole model which I've created. And that often happens in object-oriented languages because of their rigid class structure that prevents from them from this retroactive modeling. So what I can do is I can remodel the um, uh, remodel my program to, re, re, to have a different uh, structure of the traits without actually modifying anything in my existing classes. And note that I also don't have any abstract methods unimplemented because some programming language do not allow for um, abstract base class. So the class, there, there could be no uh, notion of that. And um, usually what happens is that uh, people create some methods so that the formally type satisfies everything for a compiler, but at runtime, uh, it will cause a crash. So, uh, and of course that could continue for quite long. We can model our systems based on these protocols and uh, mm, we, we can uh, create a different uh, kinds of protocols, for example, for train and so forth. And uh, we can uh, define a protocol called a uh, hybrid. And uh, hybrid is a, a electric and petrol in this. Uh, in this um, respect. I'm not sure actually if it's possible to somehow uh, enforce that to be electric and petrol or electric and diesel, uh, but of course, uh, mm, probably it's impossible. Uh, yeah, of course, but uh, at least that gives some edge. Uh, there are more limitations in Swift type system than that, uh, but, uh, but overall that's a huge step forward from uh, objective C. So uh, summary, protocol-oriented uh, programming, they focus uh, in protocol-oriented programming, you focus on types and relationship between them, not on the concrete classes and structs. Other types could be embedded into a relationship by adapting a protocol. So there is an existing relationship, established relationship, and we uh, just embed this class, new, which we created just now, we embed it into existing relationship, and it can play with the other uh, types uh, nicely without rewriting most of our program. And um, it provides an option for a retroactive data model, which I just shown. When we need to change our uh, model dramatically, uh, we can just change a few points in the protocols, protocol hierarchy. And since the types are already conforming to those protocols, we don't need to do any changes in types. <laughs>